Welcome to Vertica Unify 2021. We've been waiting for this day for such a long time, and now it's finally here. I'm Joy King. I'll be your host for today's keynote session and tomorrow as well. But in addition to the keynotes that you'll hear, you have the opportunity to participate in a wide variety of other activities, including breakout sessions led by our solution architects, by the software developers who write the Vertica code, and by our Vertica customers themselves. In addition, you can engage directly with our developers by dropping into the Developers Lounge. And you can watch all of these sessions on demand. Also, you'll have the opportunity to visit booths sponsored by our Platinum and Gold sponsors where you can see live demos of their technology. Now I want to introduce and announce a very exciting and competitive part of Vertica Unify 2021 because Vertica is a very competitive organization. I want to tell you about the Analyze to Win game, where for every session you attend, keynotes, breakouts, drop into the developer's lounge, participate and see live demos at the sponsor showcases. For each of these, you'll earn a point. For every point you earn, Vertica will contribute $1 up to $10,000 to Out of the Cage. Out of the Cage is a charity founded by one of our keynote speakers on Wednesday, Jill Deshay. And Out of the Cage helps shelters use analytics to find forever homes for dogs. So in the Analyze to Win platform, you'll not only earn points, earn prizes, but you'll have the opportunity to make a difference in a dog's life. I hope that inspires you as much as it inspires me. Today's first keynote speaker is Colin Mahoney, SVP and GM for Vertica. I am sure you'll hear the passion in his voice for the impact that we work so hard to have on the world transforming industries, improving the environment, and making a difference in the health and safety of humans and animals. Thank you, Colin, and over to you. Hello, I am Colin Mahoney, and I am honored and proud to lead Team Vertica. I've been here for over a decade, and over that time, nothing gets me more excited than the, the passion and the purpose that we as a team bring to you, our customers and our partners, as we solve some of the greatest challenges uh, that are out there for analytics and data. We've been doing this continuously over the years, and now on the cusp of Vertica 11, we've done it once again. I am so honored and proud to share with you here at Unify 2021, some of the advancements that we've made most recently, as well as the direction that we're going in the future. It's a scary time, but it's also a very exciting time in the world, especially for those of us who have that purpose and passion around data and analytics. We know that with accurate and actionable analytics, we have the power to protect the environment. We have the power to transform, if not create, entire industries and companies within. And of course, near and dear to all of us this year with COVID-19, we can improve the health of humans and animals alike. To be able to do that though, to be able to have accurate and actionable analytics, there are three tenets that we believe in wholeheartedly. One is we need to be able to operationalize machine learning with data. And we need to do that across unified data sources, not just bringing all the data into one platform, but being able to access it with a best in class engine, regardless of where it is. And number three, especially in this cloud world, we need to support clouds plural. And that goes beyond just public clouds. It's private clouds. It's also on-premises hardware. We need to be the hybrid company that can make it happen for our partners and customers to be successful. When it comes to operationalizing machine learning, there's a lot of hype and talk. And frankly, it's been there since the 1950s when Alan Turing first came out with his learning machine. But what's different today is you actually have enough processing power and you have enough data to make a real difference. What's still lacking though, is the ability to actually operationalize those things, to actually bring all of the detailed data, bring your models, bring things like Pi using Vertica Python or Vertica Pi, bring other types of, of algorithms into the mix and then actually operate against all of your data. So 
prepare the data, shape the data, shape the model, fit the model, score the model. And once you find something, execute with it and run it in your, in your organization, fully operationalized. And by the way, as we all know, that's not a one and done type thing. You actually have to do it and rerun it. But when I think about what the world is trying to focus on right now, you know, we of course have the sideshow of the cloud and it is big and it's a way that so many customers want to deploy everything. But beyond that, if you think about what's really happening in this industry, you look at the Hadoop vendors and frankly, you know, many of them have changed and become one or gone away. Uh, but the notion of a storage disruption has occurred, whether it's HDFS, whether it's S3, the ability to store vast amounts of data has spoken. And now what everybody's trying to do is figure out, well, what can I do with that data? I don't want to just store it. I want to access it. I want to report on it. I want to predict on it. I want to operationalize machine learning on it. And that's a very different challenge. Uh, you've heard about the lake house, most likely. Um, this is the notion that you want to combine the best-in-class SQL type workloads and environment with your data lake. The biggest problem, though, is most of the data lake vendors are not great at SQL. They're not great at concurrency. They're not great at making it happen uh, with speed and scale and reliability and transactional integrity. Vertica has been doing all of those things almost since day one. And what we bring to the table is the ability to integrate with so many different environments to truly make that goal of operationalized machine learning and AI a reality. But as I said, one of the most important parts of this is being able to unify your data. You've got to be able to leverage the storage disruptions, to leverage that capacity, to pull data from different environments onto the platform or have the platform go out to those different environments. The one thing that we've seen time and time again is having a great model or algorithm to shape is really useful but actually having detailed atomic level data is even more useful. And right now there's still more silos than there've ever been in organizations and being able to get at the data exhaust, the log data, the truly curated and structured data and everything else is critical to organizations and their ultimate success with everything they're trying to do with data and information. There's no doubt that one of the biggest disruptions over the last more than a decade has been the public clouds. We have at our fingertips the ability to get massive processing power, storage, uh, as well as a whole ecosystem of tooling and other capabilities. That elastic nature is so powerful in and of itself. But for us, we're also hearing from a lot of you that never have our customers felt so locked in to a particular environment. And so being able to take a platform, run it on clouds, plural, move it from one cloud to another cloud, or operate in hybrid environments where you're running it on both clouds, never has that been more important to our customers. And we are committed to making Vertica optimized on all three of the major public clouds, as well as in a lot of private cloud environments, especially with the work we're doing in containers, um, Eon mode, and some of the other endeavors that Vertica has been working on. So combining those three things gets you to the real advantage, the real Vertica advantage of the unified analytics platform. It's taking that best-in-class SQL data warehouse analytics at engine. It's adding to it much more than standard SQL. It's adding time series, geospatial, the Vertica Pi work from an ML capability standpoint. We have more analytic functions than any other company in our space. And the reality is, when we go into competitive opportunities, usually we're competing against multiple services or multiple products because no other single platform does what Vertica does. And it certainly cannot achieve it with the performance and scale that we do. And as I mentioned, having that query engine in Vertica that can actually untether itself and work in a variety of environments and reach out to the data wherever it is, is also critically important to how our customers are leveraging us.
we continue to evolve as a company, as a product, as a team. We're constantly looking at the ecosystems around us and deciding what are we really good at? What should we focus on as opposed to reinventing the wheel? And it started on a platform that was purpose-built and I think on on a great foundation uh, with a lot of key decisions that were made. But great organizations have to throw some of those decisions out the window. We have to get into changes that are happening. And there's no better example of this than the change that we made introducing Eon Mode in 2018. And I'm so proud that we now run Eon Mode on all of the major public clouds, as well as on Pure Storage, on HPE, Scality, on Dell EMC ECS, Minio, and even Hadoop HDFS. But we had to think out of the box. We had to look at the world in a very different way and say, maybe it makes sense to not just have a pure MPP system, but also to have Eon mode that separates compute and storage for these new burgeoning shared storage environments. This is an evolution that we do with our customers. And there's no better example than what we did with the trade desk. You know, Trade Desk has been a, a longtime Vertica Enterprise customer running in their own private data center, but they had a need for their auction application that runs in Amazon AWS to actually run Vertica up there as well. This is now a massive Eon environment. We have two clusters, each with over 500 nodes. Uh, each with over eight petabytes of raw data. And those clusters each have subclusters within them. But again, the benefit of Vertica Eon mode, you get that single Vertica analytic platform system, and then you can control all the subclustering and activities that happen uh, beneath it. So clearly an example of working with a great customer and evolving Vertica around many of their needs, which are shared by so many of our customers. Um, another great recognition of, of Vertica from the AI and Machine Learning Awards in 2021 is the work that we're doing with Climate Corporation. Um, I recently got a chance to, to see some of the data on population growth in this world. And it's not going to be very long before the population grows by another 50%. That's at a time where the amount of space for farming and foods is rapidly declining. So we've got to act smarter. We've got to work smarter. We've got to work smarter to manage our agriculture, our farmlands. And this award is a great example of what the Climate Corporation has done with a Vertica powered solution that is leveraging the full power of AI and machine learning to improve food security and really demonstrate the benefits of what data can do from a, an end to end supply chain planning perspective. So let me talk about some of the highlights of Vertica 11. I'm not gonna steal the thunder of, of the team that's done really all the work on this as they're gonna share with you throughout Unify 2021. But there are a couple things that I wanna highlight here that are really exciting. And the good news is they're all along the path that we've described uh, since really the first versions of Vertica. We wanna focus on the ease of deployment of course, security is baked into everything that we do. I've talked about machine learning and performance. And with every one of our releases, we are hitting all of these things. And then we're, of course, doing uh, what I refer to as the normal sit-ups and crunches to make sure that the platform uh, is constantly getting better. Uh, but let's talk about deployment options. So uh, we have officially introduced the GA of Eon now running on Azure. We had already supported AWS for a long time, as well as Google, but we've added Azure support. We've also added Dell EMC ECS support. Um, earlier this year, we announced a partnership with HPE, Apollo, and Scality. Uh, we've introduced containers, um, as well as Kubernetes orchestration. So we continue to focus on things that make it easier to deploy and manage Vertica across all the flexible environments that I was describing. Um, we've introduced FIPS compliance for security. We've gone deeper with our integration with Voltage for format preserving encryption, and we've written our own connector there um, 
to do that in, in a more efficient, and it's the highest performance voltage integration that there is in the industry. We've also greatly simplified security configurations. And I think as most of you know, Vertica has always been built on security, very tight access control security, much tighter than what you find in a lot of the other lake house environments. Um, and then end-to-end -end machine learning. You know, we, we always have said, we're not going to come up with the world's best algorithms, but what we can do is enable those algorithms and enable the, the wide ecosystems that are rapidly developing out there to take advantage of what we can do with the data. And so Vertica Pi is something that we introduced, obviously an open source project, as is our new Apache Spark connector, 2.0 connector, um, as great ways of interfacing with a broader environment, but taking advantage of what Vertica does best. Uh, we also introduced the XG Boost, and we've increased the PMML model integrations with, with Vertica. And let's not forget, when I, when I cited the fact that we have more analytic functions than any other competitor out there, so much of the power of Vertica is being able to do things like combining a time series windowing function with your ML or combining a geospatial function with some sort of time series windowing. Bringing all these things together is something that we make easier and easier in every release. And even though Mike Stonebreaker, when he originally founded the company, said uh, we would never do stored procedures, guess what? <laughs> We're doing stored procedures because you wanted them. There's so many things that we can do to help the administration and the ease of data loading or timing different behaviors or getting information to the right place at the right time. It just made sense. But we're doing it in a very open way so that our customers can easily extend the Vertica platform with those stored procedures. Of course, we continue to increase the complex data type support and what you can do on them. We are constantly improving our sorting, grouping capabilities, the optimizer in general. We're optimizing for these different cloud environments and other things. Um, and then as you can see, just one example, I think for those of you who have been asking about doing um, some improvements on things like the width clause, we've delivered some rapid processing there as well. So just a couple highlights of things that show our commitment to the mission that we're on. I also want to announce something else very exciting. We recently closed on an acquisition of a longtime strategic partner, Full360, who brings really deep expertise of Vertica, especially when it comes to running Vertica up in the clouds, uh, with migration tools, a lot of IP around the Elastic Data Warehouse and, and what we're doing with our own as a service, which I'll touch on in, in a second. Um, but they have been a partner of ours and actually delivered the first Vertica managed service back in 2009. They're ISO 27001 compliant. They've got a great relationship with AWS as well. And in addition to the IP, they bring a great set of playbooks, certifications, and know-how for our customers that are running Vertica up in the cloud. We are also introducing Vertica Eon Accelerator, which is Vertica as a service. It's all the value of Vertica with automated administration. Let us handle the upgrades. Let us manage your Vertica environment. However, let us do it on your own AWS environment with your AWS account. I can't tell you how many times I come across customers that are using other products. And one of their number one frustrations is that they have to buy services through another company from AWS when in fact they get a better deal on AWS or they prefer to use their account in AWS for a variety of reasons. We are extending that flexibility and choice that is core to our mission in Vertica as a service Eon Accelerator. You get to use your own cloud account. You get to control your data. We don't have access to it. But what we will do is manage the entire Vertica environment for you so that you don't have to worry on the uptime. It's built in Eon mode, highly scalable. Um, AWS is the first cloud we're going to support, or we do support. We, of course, want to support others. It's minutes and clicks to provision. Um, it includes all monitoring, upgrades, again, on your AWS account. Um, but you get to take full advantage of all the unique capabilities that Vertica has 
So you don't have to give anything up for SaaS. You get the, the real Vertica and that flexibility, but it's about creating that database as simple as one, two, three clicks and you're online. One of the things that we've learned a lot about with our, our customer use cases, just having watched customers run Vertica on their own up on the clouds is there are certain things they don't want to have to do. And those are exactly the things that we're taking um, over for them. But at the same time, we're allowing them the control that they want across the board. So Vertica Eon Accelerator Access, early access is open. It's free. I highly recommend everybody go on and sign up, give it a try, give us your feedback um, and tell us what you think. We are incredibly excited about it. We already have some early partners like Natsoft who've been trying it. They're giving us a lot of great feedback about what we're able to do up there. Again, lots of feedback around this is the best of both worlds. It's the best kept secret. When can we go live with it? We've got customers and partners who want it immediately. Our future is very much in line with what we've been focused on. But I will say one area that we're gonna to continue to really, really pound is automation and ease of use. You know, So much of what we're learning about how our customers use the Vertica environment and where we can add the most value is around ease of use. And if you combine our hybrid capabilities, the flexibility, the rich and robust, analytic functions that we have, the scale, the performance, and then you layer in improved ease of use, there is no platform that can do what we can do. And it will take a long time for them to catch up. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about UI, UX. We're spending a lot of time leveraging Vertica's own capabilities to improve uh, the product itself. If you think about what we've always done with database designer and things like that, we also want to get Eon Accelerator out, as I mentioned, to multiple platforms. We're going to continue to converge enterprise and Eon mode, so you'll get that experience uh, throughout. You won't have to choose your modality. And again, we will continue to leverage our own analytic capabilities to drive change. Our real vision and passion here is that at some point, You'll put data into the Vertica analytic environment, and SQL may not just be the input, but it could become the output. We know a lot about the data that is in Vertica. We have a lot of correlations and heuristics that we're doing anyway to optimize the layout. And we've started experimenting with publishing some of those things so that our customers can actually see those correlations without necessarily having to ask for them. So a little tease on some of the things that we've been thinking about as our future. You may have seen it. Uh, we have been running an Analytics for Pioneers campaign, and that is what Vertica does best. If you think back to all the data disruptors that we've been powering uh, for more than a decade, we have driven some of the greatest change in this industry powered by data. And getting into this next chapter of unlimited scale, unlimited quantities, uh, with operationalizing machine learning is incredibly exciting for us. I will leave you with the way that we think about data as an asset. It's incredibly powerful for every organization, uh, but only predictive analytics and proactive actions on the full scale of all your data, regardless of where it lives, can truly change the world. And we are committed to continuing our innovation every single day to create this unified analytics platform that can analyze all the data wherever it resides with that speed, accuracy, and proactive action to make sure that that analytic result ends up in the right place at the right time. That has been our mission from day one. I'm super excited to be part of this team, leading this team, and to share this with you in Unify 2021. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you for being our customers and trusting us. We are going to continue to deliver, and I hope you have a great few days here at Unify 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. As you always say, the next release is always the best release. And Vertica 11 combined with early access for Vertica Eon Accelerator makes this an even more exciting year. 
Our next speaker is Jeff Ma. Now, for those of you that have seen the movie 21, you'll recognize this story and many great insights that Jeff is going to share, including why the house doesn't always win. Hello and welcome to my session at Vertica Unify. It's called How to Win with Data. So who am I? I'm Jeff Ma. And for those of you guys that have seen the movie 21, you'll know what I like to call Hollywood magic. And I mean true Hollywood magic is how you turn an average looking Asian American male into a dashing British white guy, which is what they did in the movie 21. Um, back in uh, 2001, a friend of mine named Ben Mesrick, uh, he'd written six books at the time but it's fair to say that his career was at a real crossroads and he was contemplating not being a writer anymore. And I approached him and I said, hey, Ben, um, I have an idea for your next book. And he says, well, what is it? And I said, me and my buddies from MIT, we go to Vegas and we use math to beat the casinos. And he said, you know what? I don't think anyone wants to read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds. So I took him with me to Vegas about three weeks later. And he said, oh, my God, this is the coolest thing we should write a book about this. And I was like, oh, great idea, Ben. So then we approached his publisher and his publisher said, you know what, it seems like an interesting story, but I don't think anyone wants to read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds. And we didn't listen to her. And we eventually wrote a book called Bring It On The House. It was a New York Times bestseller for over a year. And then eventually got turned into a movie called 21. 21 was number one in the box office and made, I think, 35, sorry, $150 million off a $35 million budget. So in the end, people did want to see a movie and read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds, um, which was cool. So the nerds kind of won. And obviously at this kind of conference, we feel like the nerds are still flourishing. Um, but um, Ben went on to write a book called The Accident of Billionaires, which got turned into a movie called The Social Network, which actually won an Oscar. And so Ben Mesrick won an Oscar, but I can say I made Ben Mesrick who he is today. So that's one of my claim to fame. So um, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about some of the stories that weren't in the book, weren't in the movie. The first one um, comes from the opening of the Bellagio. And I like to tell this story because like at the beginning or the opening of any casino, there's always, you know, really three types of people there. There's celebrities, there's card counters, and I often ask people, what's the third type of person? Can you guess? Well, we'll just say that it's uh, women that are looking to make pr profit off of both those celebrities and those uh, high rollers. So um, at the opening of the Bellagio, we actually had, uh, a, you know, we were at a, a blackjack table and we had the pleasure of sitting down and playing blackjack with Kevin Costner. And Kevin was a, a pretty good blackjack player, meaning he did the right thing most of the time. Uh, but then he started to lose, and I'm, I'm not kidding you, for about, I don't know, 20 minutes, he seemed to lose every hand in a row. And every time he would lose a hand, his friends would look at me and say, God, this is like water rolled all over again. Another one of my favorite stories comes from the first NBA lockout. So there was a recent NBA lockout. I guess it really wasn't that recent anymore. And during the first NBA lockout, I had the pleasure of playing blackjack with a bunch of the New York Knicks. So... This was, and this was at Foxwoods Casino in Connecticut. I played with um, John Starks and Patrick Ewing and Alan Houston. And I had the pleasure of sitting down and playing with John Starks. And I don't know if you guys remember John Starks, sort of this gritty guy from the streets, fought for everything he could in the world of basketball. He sat down next to me and kind of went through this transformation that I'm sure many of you guys have seen your friends go through. You've probably never gone through it yourself, where you start as this kind of intelligent, you know, sober human being. And then, you know, four hours later, he was a drunk degenerate gambler. And John reached into his pocket and put his last $500 down in the betting circle. And the dealer gave him an 11. And then the dealer showed a six. So those of you guys that play blackjack know what you need to do there. You actually need to double down, which means you need another $500 and you can play each, sorry. And then you, you get one more card and you basically get to double your bet. But John didn't have $500, so he's like searching through his pockets looking for $500. I flip him a $500 chip and it say, pay me back when you win. So the dealer gives him a five to make 16. John looks at me, he goes, man, you just jinxed me. And of course, since I'm counting cards, I have a pretty good idea that John's still gonna win. <clears throat> the dealer flips a 10 to make 16 and then gets another 10 to make 26, pays John back. 
his thousand dollars. <throat> John gives me my five hundred dollars back without a word of thank you. And it was that day that I decided I would never have John Starks on my fantasy basketball team. <laughs> so finally, my favorite story is uh, comes from the filming of the movie. So those of you guys that have seen 21, you know that I'm in the movie, correct? I know, it's a real dull silence. It's an even more dull silence in the virtual world. Believe me, when I used to do this in real life, it would still be a dull silence. No, I play a dealer in the movie named Jeffrey, and the deal, the person who plays me, Jim Sturgis, walks up to me and says, Jeffrey, my brother from another mother, we have this witty back and forth. I have a SAG card. I have three lines. If you guys want to go back and watch it, it's at about 59 minutes and three seconds. So this wonderful scene that took probably three days to film. On the second day of filming, <clears throat> and sadly none of you guys seem to remember it, on the second day of filming, um, the cast, so this is Kate Bosworth and Lawrence Fishburne, and they all come up to me and they say, hey, Jeff, um, we'd love to take you to dinner tonight after we're done filming, and thank you for letting us tell your story on the big screen. And I said, okay, that would be great. So they um, you know, come up to me after filming, and we will walk over to the Palms Casino to eat dinner. And as we're walking over, Kate Bosworth pulls me aside. He says, She says, hey, Jeff, um, I have a fun idea for what you and I can do after dinner. And keep in mind, I'm 30 and single at this time. I'm thinking, well, wow, this is pretty cool. Kate Bosworth. And she says, I think it would be a really good idea if we all go play blackjack together and you can coach us and we can win lots of money. And I was like, oh, man, first of all, that's not what I was hoping. And second of all, that's a terrible idea, Kate. And she says, why? And I said, well, we're going to the Palms Casino. They know me very well. There's no way they're going to let me play blackjack. And she said, it's OK. You'll be with me. I'm a big star. They won't bother you. And I said, Kate, it's been a long time since Blue Crush. I don't know what a big star you are anymore. But what seemed like a terrible idea after five or six bottles of wine at dinner seemed like a great idea. And we go downstairs to the Palms Casino to sit down and play blackjack. And I sit down at the table and the floor person looks at me and he says, Jeff, what are you doing? And I said, I'm here to play blackjack with Kate Bosworth, Blue Crush, big star, no big deal, right? And he says, let me check. And he says, not only are you not allowed to play blackjack, but if your little friend Kate's at the table, you're not allowed to be within 20 feet of the table. And so that was a tough moment, but at least Kate thought I was super tough. It didn't get me anywhere with her, but at least she thought I was dangerous. And she went and told everyone on set the next day how dangerous I was. So those are my kind of stories that's your bonus for tuning in that, that weren't in the book, weren't in the movie. You only get to see them when you listen to me virtually speak. So I'm going to tell you guys a story of how I learned to be data-driven. And ultimately, that's sort of been the, the sort of premise of my life is being data-driven. And Blackjack, in many ways, was big data before there was even such a thing. You know, Vertica, obviously, is one of the you know, greatest you know, pieces of software that helps initiate the big data movement. But Blackjack was before Vertica and actually helped people understand sort of how important um, you know, big data or data could be or data-driven decision-making. So I tell this story as one of the greatest lessons I had in learning to be data-driven. So I'm 21 years old, had just learned this blackjack system, which was all basically math, using math to beat the casinos. And I'd been playing blackjack for, I don't know, probably five or six months. I roll up to a blackjack table and I bet, because the math tells me to, two hands of $10,000. And on the first one, I get a nine. On the second one, I get 11. On the third one, I get a five. Uh, sorry, on the first hand, I get a pair of nines. The second hand, I get 11. And the dealer has a five showing. So the pair of nines against a five is a hand that I split. So that means I put another $10,000 down. I get to play each nine separately. On the first nine, I get a two to make 11. And so I have to double that down. So I put another $10,000 down. And I get an eight to make 19. And then the nine is actually a hand I hit, obviously, and I get a jack on that to make 19. And the 11 against the five is another hand I need to double down. So I do, and I get a eight to make 19. So I have 19, 19, 19 against the dealer's five. I have $50,000 on the table, and the dealer has a five showing. The dealer flips a six to make 11, uh-oh, and then gets a king to make 21. So I lose $50,000. This woman behind me shrieks, oh my God, that's my entire mortgage. And I want to turn around and go, where the hell do you live? Because where I live in Silicon Valley, that's a cardboard box in the tenderloin. But I can't get fixated on the woman behind me and my, you know, losing my half of her mortgage and or her mortgage. 
And it's one of those moments where now the math calls for me to bet uh, three hands of $10,000. And I don't really want to. The idea of putting more money at stake at that moment after having lost all that money is really not something I want to do. And this is one of those moments that I often reflect on how did I get here? So I graduated in, from MIT in 1994 with a mechanical engineering degree that I've never used in my life. It makes my <laughs> parents enormously happy or has made them enormously happy. And then um, in uh, 1995, I kind of moved back to Boston and started a bunch of internet companies. I kind of felt like this whole internet thing was, was really going somewhere. Thank you, Al Gore. And you know, we really um, had an opportunity. I had an opportunity to, to become an entrepreneur. And so I did, and I started a variety of different companies. And then the book Moneyball and the movie Moneyball came out. And that <clears throat> was a very formative moment for me because ultimately it made me realize that there was an opportunity for me to go after my passion. And I'd always been truly passionate about sports. And the idea that there was an intersection between analytics and sports happening was really exciting to me. So I went and I started a company in sort of sports analytics space, eventually sold that company to Yahoo, and then um, started focusing on where else could this go. And one of the places that I really thought it could go was in the world of human capital management. So I got into this idea of how can you use data analytics to actually manage people. And I started a company called 10Xer that I was lucky enough to sell to Twitter. Went to go work at Twitter for three and a half years, eventually leading data science and analytics there. We were very happy Vertica customers there. That's obviously the first time I came across Vertica. Um, all of my data science used, data scientists used it. And um, But what, what really was sort of the arc during that whole time was that I was a professional blackjack player. And so what does that mean? That means I was a person that was using math to beat the casinos um, using probability and statistics. And that's kind of like what ultimately has brought me here today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what Blackjack taught me. And the first thing I'm gonna talk about is why be data-driven. So there's some really basic lessons that Blackjack teaches you about being data-driven. And the first is the fact that the average Blackjack player loses about 3% of the money they put on the table. If you learn to play basic strategy perfectly, and, and hopefully you'll see on the card behind me, this idea of a, a matrix of decisions, right? Where you know what your cards are and you know what the dealer's cards are, and based on that, there's only one right decision, and that's called basic strategy. And if you just memorize that chart perfectly, you go from losing about 3% of the money you put on the table to all of a sudden only losing half a percent, right? And you don't have to do any card counting or anything like that. All you're doing is memorizing every decision that's being made. But a lot of people don't follow basic strategy perfectly. And it's because we as human beings, and one of the reasons that we really need to be data-driven is because we as human beings are bad at making decisions. We're very, very emotional, okay? We're very um, prone to using emotion to bias our decisions. And one of the really interesting biases that we have is something called omission bias. And so the, the example of this is if you have uh, 15 and the dealer has a nine showing, you know, the the odds say that you should hit, like you should take a card. But the problem with that is, if you get a seven, an eight, a nine, a 10, a jack, a queen, a king, you're gonna lose right away. So many people will decide not to take a card, hoping that the dealer has to take a card. And if the dealer doesn't and somehow beats you, well, at least you weren't the cause of your own demise. And that's called omission bias. And it's a very tough bias that we all have. Actually, one of the most personal stories of my life, it comes from this concept of omission bias. So I was doing a speech in, um, actually like, uh, so I wrote a book called The House Advantage, Playing the Odds to Win Big in Business, which is available on Amazon. And since this is a virtual conference, you can maybe pause me right now and order this on Amazon. It's called The House Advantage, Playing the Odds to Win Big in Business. I'll pause for a second so you guys can order it. Okay. Now, what, when I wrote that book, one of the things that I did and what I, I tried to write that book was write a very mainstream book on data analytics that anyone would read. And when I was publicizing the book, one of the outlets that I went to was, um, was uh, Good Morning America. And the producer for Good Morning America said to me, hey, Jeff, you know, this is a really awesome story, but, you know, there's, this isn't a business show and we need some personal stories, like things that like you, we could tell on a show like Good Morning America. And I had never had a story about that. 
until this incident happened. So I was at Lake Tahoe, driving back to San Francisco, about to fly to Asia to do a 10 city speaking tour of Asia. And my cell phone rings and it's my dad. And he says, son, I have some bad news for you. And at that time my parents were living back in Boston. And he said, your mom has suffered a stroke. And I said, is it bad? And he said, yeah, it's very bad. And I said, okay, well, I'm gonna cancel my um, Asia speaking tour. I'm gonna fly back to Boston. So I flew back to Boston. When I got back there, I saw that my dad wasn't exaggerating. My mom could not move the right side of her body, could not speak, could not acknowledge me when I walked in the door. And as we, my sisters came home, we sat down with the neurosurgeon. He said, I wanna go over your options. And he said, well, your options are normally in a situation like this with a woman of this age who just suffered this big a brain bleed, we like to do nothing. And we like to hope the blood resorbs and we don't wanna do more damage. And we said, okay, well, what are her chances of surviving if you do that? Well, she has a 22% chance to survive past 60 days. And I said, wow, I don't really like those odds. What are other options? And he said, well, actually, because your mom was in such great shape before this, and we'd love to try to give her a chance of having somewhat of a normal life going forward. We think, honestly, in this case, we should go be aggressive. And we think it gives her a better chance, but we could do more harm. And as he was saying this, it reminded me of hitting 15 versus a nine. If we thought the right decision, even it might be quote unquote, the riskier one to actually win, which is giving my mom a real life going forward, then we should do it. And so I stood up and I started talking about blackjack and my sisters and my dad are like, oh my God, this blackjack stuff has really gone to his head. But when they got over that and they listened to me, they were like, oh my God, he's probably right. We should probably operate. So they went in, they operated, they took the blood clot out. The um, neurosurgeon came back in and said, hey, I can't imagine that I have gone better. The next day my mom started to perk up. Two days later, she started to speak. Three days later, I felt comfortable enough to fly to Asia to do my Asia speaking tour, the rest of it. And as I was leaving, I was getting married nine months later. I said to my mom, I just wanna make sure you and I can dance at my wedding. And she said, that'll be easy. And I'm proud to say that nine months later, my mom and I did dance at my wedding. And she led a pretty great life after that. She let, We had her for about 10 more years. She passed a few years ago to another stroke, unfortunately. but. If any of you guys have ever had that situation where you get that gift of almost like an extra 10 years, that's amazing. And we owe a lot of that to this idea of overcoming cog uh, omission bias, this cognitive bias. So 15 versus nine, hit it. And it, it, it's, it's definitely something that was a, a formative thing for me. I also think there's this concept, and I always joke about who the most dangerous human being in the world is, and it's you know Malcolm Gladwell, right? Because he can take these largely wrong concepts and they're right about them in such a way that you go, oh my God, this is great. And the idea of a gut feeling or blinking to make decisions, right? That's not true, right? We need to be data-driven. And I, this is obviously a crowd that I don't necessarily need to say this to. But there is a lot of this idea of other biases that you really understand. And, and one of the things that you should take away from this is, these are the stories you tell your friends that aren't data-driven to try to help them become more data-driven, right? This idea that um, when we make decisions, right, oftentimes we evaluate those decisions based on the outcome and not the actual decision. So 15 versus nine, let's say sometime you guys run into me in Vegas when we're back in real life having these real conferences and you say, hey, Jeff, I remember your speech, 15 versus nine, you're sitting at a blackjack table. You say, what am I supposed to do here? And I say, you're supposed to hit. If you get six to make 21, you turn around, high five me, we're best friends forever. If you get seven to make 22 and lose, you're like, why did they ever make a movie or a book about you? But in both cases, that decision was correct. One just suffered a poor outcome and the other didn't. And ultimately, this is this concept of trusting the process, right? This is the joke that they made for the, about the Philadelphia 76ers. But I think sports is a really great analogy for this because oftentimes when you watch football, there are all these decisions that they make in football, specifically going for it on fourth down. And data and analytics will tell you that you need to go for it more on fourth down, right? But yet people don't because they're afraid of failing unconventionally, right? They'd rather, fa they'd rather fail conventionally than unconventionally. And oftentimes commentators will evaluate these decisions based on whether they got it or not. They go for it on fourth and one, they don't get it, they're an idiot, they go for it on fourth and four, they get it, they're a genius.
but the decision and the outcome are totally separate. And again, this is another one of those things that you know is super hard for us to like divorce the outcome from the decision, but it's really important in terms of becoming better at, at making decisions. So why is blackjack beatable? Well, blackjack is the only game in the um, casino that's subject to something called conditional probability, meaning what you see impacts what you're going to see. So if you contrast that to like roulette and craps, roulette spin of every wheel, like if it's six reds in a row, people are you better but black, but we all know that's not true. Every spin of that roulette wheel is independent. We walk into a craps table, you say, hey, how's this table been? How's the shooter? Well, it doesn't really matter. Those dice are the dice and they have a distribution and the distribution is what it is. But blackjack is different. If I take all ace, all four aces out of a deck of cards, hand you that deck of cards, what do you think the chance of you dealing yourself blackjack are? None. There's no way, right? And so blackjack is a game with a memory like an elephant and these other games are like fish, hence the iconography. So I'm going to talk a little bit about counting cards. So if then if blackjack is a game with a memory and what you see impacts what you're going to see, all you need to do is simply track the cards you've seen so you know what cards remain. And with that, you can actually make informed decisions. So it turns out that when there's a lot of, when you've seen a lot of high cards, that means there's a lot of low cards left and that's bad for you as a player. When you've seen a lot of low cards, that means there's a lot of high cards left and that's good for you as a player, right? So twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes are bad. Tens and face cards and aces are good, right? So it's as simple as that. Like the whole notion of Rain Man, the one for good, two for bad kind of thing, isn't that far off. But you don't need to be Rain Man to count cards. You just need to practice. And it's just like anything else. You look at data from the past to inform your decisions going forward. So here I am, Jeffrey the dealer, in case you guys didn't believe me. Um, but I have this up as kind of a joke, but also to talk about one of the most difficult decisions I ever made at the blackjack table. So those of you guys that have played blackjack, okay, you'll know, I would be curious to know if any of you guys have ever split tens. And if you have, I probably sign you up to be the first customer of the new casino that I'm opening, because unless you're counting cards, splitting tens is a terrible idea. But I told you that card counting is the knowledge of how many face cards versus low cards remain. And imagine that almost every card that you haven't seen is a face card and you have a pair of tens and the dealer has a six showing. Then maybe you should split those tens because it's a higher expected value. And this is something that you learn pretty far into your time. And I had just learned this. <clears throat> I walked into the MGM Grand Casino and I sit down at the table and I bet two hands of 8,000. And the dealer gives me a blackjack on one hand and a pair of tens on the second. The blackjack, obviously, they pay me $12,000, but then she starts to go right by my pair of 10s. And I looked at her and I said, um, excuse me, ma'am. And as I'm looking at the cards, I'm like, oh my God, this is a hand I need to split based on the probability on the numbers. And she says, you want to what? And I said, I think I want to split these. And I said, um, are you sure? She said, are you sure? And I said, huh. And then I like kind of was like, why am I having so much reluctance about this? And I look around the entire table I look around at like the uh, floor people and I realize that even though the math is very clear, I don't want to split these tens. And why is that? It's because I don't want to cause conflict. I know that if I split these tens, everyone at the table is going to hate me. Everyone at the floor on the floor is going to think I'm an idiot. All the people watching are to think I'm an idiot and they're going to all think I am this just punk that has too much money and that is just making stupid decisions. And I don't wanna be that person, right? But what's happening? I'm falling for something called groupthink, where I'm making a decision, right, to avoid conflict. And you think about everything that we have in our lives right now, the incre increased computing power, the better access to data, things like Vertica. It allows us to make decisions that we wouldn't have made 10 years ago, three years ago, a year ago. Right, And so if you make decisions to avoid conflict, you're actually stifling innovation. And that's a really important thing to understand, right? And again, like to take back with you on why be data-driven, why be bold on the decisions you make, right? It's a very important thing to think about. So I can't fall for groupthink. So I'm sitting there staring, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? 
And I'm like, all right, don't fall for group thing. But I still don't want to split these tens. Why is that? And I realized that I have a pair of tens against dealer six, which is a winning hand. And the last thing I want to do is break up that winning hand, right? But that's obviously not optimizing correctly because ultimately I know it's a higher expected value to split these tens. It doesn't matter whether I have a quote unquote winner now, it just matters how much I can optimize my winnings, right? And now I'm falling for another kind of bias called loss aversion, where we fear loss more than we value gain. And that causes us to make bad decisions. This is also called, you know, endowment bias. Um, and the idea of this is when you own something or when you think you, you value it too high. And it's, again, one of the reasons that people have trouble innovating. When I moved to Silicon Valley, there were, you know, there was a company called Apple, I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with, that was trading for about $60. And about, you know, there's a bunch of us that were all working in startups, all using Apple products. And we're like, this is silly. This is a great, this is a great company. Really, like we should, we should all be buying Apple stocks. We all did. And Apple went from, uh, I think, 60 to 120 and I don't know, period of like 11 months. And everyone doubled their money. And one of my buddies came back and he said, hey, I'm going to sell the Apple. And I said, why? And he said, well, we just doubled our money. I don't want to lose any. Well, do you think Apple's a buy or sell? Once? Well, I think it's a buy. Well, why would you sell it? Right? The decision to buy or sell Apple is really just about what you think about Apple. It's not necessarily anything to do about where you bought it. Similarly, there's a company called Facebook. And I was telling this story once at Facebook. And so I spoke there first when they had 30 million users, the next time I spoke there, which I swear was like a year and a half, two years later, they had 500 million users. And as I walk in there and tell this story, I say, now that you guys have 500 million users, are you gonna take the same kind, and before the words were out of my mouth, an executive from the back row named Chamath, who I'm sure many of you guys now know about, screamed, hell yeah. And he knew that for them to continue to succeed and grow, they would have to continue to take chances. Right. And obviously the way they've executed has been pretty incredible. Obviously, there's there's a lot of things that they've done that have been challenging also. But the desire to continue to take chances and optimize winning over fearing losing is incredibly important and an incredible lesson. So can't be loss averse, can't fall for group think. Right. So as I sit there and think through this, I'm like, OK, well, I guess I gotta split these tens. I can't fall for groupthink. I put another $8,000 down, the dealer gives me an ace on one, a nine on the second, the dealer flips a six, gets a 10 to make 16, and then another 10 to make 26. I win my $16,000, the dealer pays me, the shoe's over, I run away from the table because everyone at the table now wants to kill me. But in many ways, I owe that moment, right, again, to overcoming these types of cognitive biases, which are many times very difficult to overcome. So let's talk a little bit about analytics, right? And obviously I, I alluded to the fact that I ran analytics and data science at Twitter for a while, was a super happy Vertica customer. Uh, when I got there, I knew very little about how to do analytics at scale. And after my time there, I kind of came up with what I call this sort of framework, what I call a pyramid in two dimensions, it's a triangle, as you can see here. And I think a lot about the three levels of what you need to be successful with analytics. And in many ways, it's this super interesting, I think in the world that you guys live in and the, the, the clients and the all the people that you work with, we'll start with this bottom level, which is data. And at the core, data is the best way to create a competitive advantage. Do you have data that no one else has? Do you have customer data that no one else has? Are you collecting data that no one else has? But the challenge with data, right, is that you have to be patient. You have to collect and invest. And I often, I work in startups now, I work with Microsoft, and we really try to help startups figure out, you know, how to be successful. And people ask me all the time about data strategies for startups. And I said, well, the challenge is when you first start a startup, right, you don't have much data but you have to be very forward thinking and you have to actually like, you know, start creating the instrumentation, start creating like the, the, the collection, the data structures, the data engineering, whatever it is to start to collect the data that you need because you may not reap the benefits from it for a while, 
but you actually need to start collecting it. And I think that's one of the things that's hard for people to understand. I work for a hotel company um, where we were doing revenue management on, on hotels, right? So like basically trying to come up with optimized pricing. And one of the challenges in that, in that industry was that so many of these hotels were on these old systems that were on-prem, right? They weren't in the cloud. So getting data out of the systems was one of our core advantages, being able to like have that send us a flat file every day that we can ingest and put into the cloud that allow us to do analysis, allow us to do AI or machine learning on it to come up with optimized pricing. But again, that key of pulling the data out was so important, right? So data at the core, this, this idea of using data to create a competitive advantage is at the core one of the most key you know, things that I think that you really need to think about as a way to gain an advantage. Um, how do you use data to gain advantage? And then finally, with everything that's going on with GDPR and just privacy in general and everything that Apple's doing, you, know, you got to think a lot about this idea of data ethics. And one of the things I felt very strongly about and, and was very proud of when I was at Twitter is like we had a very ethical way of dealing with customer data. And ultimately, the question that I always ask myself when I think about customer data is, is are we using customer data for the good of the customer? And I will always go back to the example of my wife. My wife does not like to be tracked on the internet, does not like to have cookies, like does not like any of that. But yet she will look at me and say, this is like the third thing I bought on Instagram today. They really know so much about me and it doesn't bother her because they are help, they're providing a value to her by giving her really, really good targeting of things that she wants to buy. She can choose whether or not to buy them, but at least she's getting the right ads. And so I do think if you're doing right by the customer, you can be aggressive in how you use data. And if you're very upfront about it, right? The hope of GDPR in many ways is that it makes it so much more transparent in how people are using data that people get more comfortable with it, right? The creepy thing is when people are using your data and you don't even know it and you have no ability to see what they're using or, or anything like that. So then that second level, right, that we talked about, the level above data is analysis. What I like to think about analysis, right, and is that it's really not just math, it's science. At Twitter, my strongest data scientists were people that came out of real science backgrounds. There was a woman that worked for me who was an amazing data scientist. She had an econ PhD, a PhD in econ from MIT. And she had never done quote unquote data science until she got out of school. She went and did a boot camp and learned all the necessary computer techniques and things like that, data engineering that she needed to do, right? But at the core of all of it, right, was the fact that she understood how to do science on that data. She knew under, how, to, how to be hypothesis driven and how to make hypotheses and test them via the data. And that's what made her super successful. So as you think about hiring and you think about the, like this idea of scientific method or of science versus math, I think is super important. You need to be willing as practitioners or your, your practitioners, right? Your professionals, your industry experts, they need to ask questions and challenge, right? You need to be understanding what the right business questions to ask are. What are the highly leveraged things that we need to solve for that the data scientists can look at the data and try to solve for, right? That is so important, right? Really asking questions. And if a data scientist or someone comes to you with something that doesn't make sense, don't just accept it, push back and iterate. This is a process. This isn't like throw some stuff over the wall, they come back with it, we're done. This is a process, right? And then finally, treat data scientists as first-class citizens. If you are a data scientist, act like a first-class citizen, have a seat at the table, be in the meetings where someone is actually talking about the real business challenges, the real business questions. Make sure you have enough visibility because ultimately you're gonna come up with the best solution if you have the most context, right? Don't just leave the data scientists separate. Don't do your business meeting and then go to a separate, like have everyone have a seat at the table. And at that level, have someone that's a C-level executive that understands this stuff, that has the ear of the CEO. And that brings me to the last point, And this is ultimately one of the ones that is most important, which is if you think about it, you got data, you got analysis, and then all of a sudden, how are we gonna implement this stuff? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna get, use this to provide value, right? And ultimately, this is where most companies I think fail because they don't have the courage to take that data 
and make really difficult decisions with it or take that analysis. So the first thing you want to do from an implementation standpoint is create a culture for experimentation. Allow at Twitter, we had thousands of experiments running at any time. Any new feature that we wanted to test or put out there was literally released in an A-B experiment where it was like done on a population where they could hold back some of it. Everything almost that we released, even to the entire population, had a small holdback. So we could see and measure the causal impact of that change, of that feature. So the idea of an experiment, of an experimentation or really like incremental iterations is so key to this whole thing, right? You really need to like create that culture of experimentation. You need to have a strong organizational approach, right? It has to be, if you look at the best sports teams, right, these days, the best sports teams are the ones where the owner, all the way down to the coach, to the players, believe in some level of data-driven decision-making. You know, one of the greatest like stories that, that I've ever heard is when Shane Battier was teaching LeBron James to be sort of like data driven. You know, he was like teaching him how to guard Kevin Durant and he was showing them the data about the ways to guard him. And, you know, LeBron took that information and went out and sort of shut KD down in a game. And that idea of like showing him the data and then allowing him to implement and then having those obviously results <laughs> drive the evaluation of the decision was so important. But the fact that Shane Battier was so bought into data analytics, and obviously he's a smart guy, went to Duke, et cetera. That was so core to that team being successful and eventually obviously winning a championship. And then finally, this idea of incremental improvements, right? You know, much of what the analytics promise of analytics is, 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 is incremental, right? Like if you think about blackjack, we had a small advantage on every hand, right? And over the course of time, if we bet enough, ultimately we're gonna win but we can't do it all in one bet. We wouldn't want to have a 2% advantage with only $1 million bet because obviously there's tons of variance there. So create incremental improvements all over time and that ultimately will get you in the right place. So finally, you guys are probably all like, oh my God, what happened to Jeff when he lost all that money and he had another you know, $30,000 to bet and that's what the math, what did he do? He must've walked away. Of course I didn't walk away. I'm a believer in data-driven decision-making. So I bet three hands of $10,000. I got the woman behind me shrieking about her house. I get a nine on the first hand, a 19 on the second one, and an ace four on the third hand. The dealer has a six showing. The nine against the six is a hand that I double down. So I do, and I get a queen on that to make 19. The 19 against the six is another hand that I just stand, and then the ace four against the six is actually a hand I need to double down, so I do, and I get a four on that to make 19. So I have 19, 19, 19, again, against this dealer six, is a chance to win back everything I just lost or I guess to lose two of those women's houses, right? So this is one of those moments in time where I'm like, how did I get here? What should I do? But the only reason that I'm here right now with the chance to win back everything I just lost is because I believe in math and I believe in sort of all of these, overcoming all of these cognitive biases. So the dealer flips a king to make 16 and then gets a five to make 21. I lose another $50,000. The shoe's over, I am just crushed, I'm out of money. I go up to my room at Caesar's Palace, collapse on the floor, stare up at the ceiling, wonder to myself, why is there a mirror up there? But when I get over that, I start thinking about what do I do next? And I think about these lessons that I learned during my time playing Jack, blackjack. And the first thing I think about is this concept of action over inaction, this idea that like, hey, maybe I don't want to make this decision yet. Maybe I'll go back to Boston and I'll put off this decision and I won't lose any money because I'm not playing. But that's favoring inaction or reaction. I can't do that. That's being omission biased. And then I think a lot about this concept of a long-term perspective. And I think one of the things that companies that are public or anyone that is in sales, one of the challenges you have is ultimately that um, you have to be very short-term driven. And even like we do OKRs right now and like KRs being quarterly, you need to have a long-term perspective and then you make better decisions. And over the course of time, I'd done quite well playing blackjack. It was just this hand that really was kind of throwing me off. So I can't quit because of that. And then I think about the idea, like it's okay to lose. Like I, I didn't want to lose, but it's okay to lose. And then finally, I think about this idea of like, had I made a bad decision and suffered a poor outcome or had I made a good decision and just gotten unlucky? 
And I felt pretty clear that like my process was solid. So I went back down and I kept playing. And over the course of the day, I won back um, another sort of $70,000. So I uh, sorry, $100,000. So I've told this story a variety of times, and actually one of the times I told this story, uh, I was speaking at a conference that Vinod Khosla was putting on, and the speaker before me that day was um, a guy by the name of Bill Gates, so it was super intimidating. And as I was telling the story, Vinod stood up, and he started like kind of waving his finger at me, and he said, I don't believe you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, Jeff, how could you? How could you have doubted yourself? How could you have questioned the math? And I realized, that in many ways he was right. Like I had never really doubted myself. And ultimately I think this is one of the greatest lessons that I can teach you guys or I can leave you with, which is this idea that like, you know, this stuff is something you have to stick with. And as an entrepreneur, I've sold four different companies that I've started. And it's not because I'm the smartest or had the best ideas or the hardest working entrepreneur, it's because I might be the most stubborn. And, you know, I, I, I think about this a lot because this is ultimately one of the greatest lessons. And as I mentioned, this is one of the things that fueled me to keep going down and playing. And over the next day, I won back that $100,000. And then the last day I was there, I won $70,000. So I ended up leaving that weekend up $70,000 after this sort of tremendous defeat. And I do think if there's one thing I can leave you with, hopefully, it's this idea that you got to stick with these processes. You got to be stubborn. And you got to see things through and have a long-term perspective. So thank you guys for letting me speak to you today. And hopefully you enjoyed it and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Jeff. Stubborn is a quality I can relate to. And I love the idea of using it to fuel the never give up attitude. Our next speaker is Amy Fowler, VP of Strategy and Solutions at Pure Storage. Pure Storage is a platinum sponsor for Vertica Unify and a very valued partner for Vertica as we bring cloud-native architecture of Vertica in Eon mode to on-premises data centers with Pure Storage FlashBlades technology. After Amy and after this keynote, you'll be able to stop by the sponsor showcase and see live demos of the Pure Storage FlashBlades technology. And remember, you earn points for every time you visit a sponsor showcase. Now, over to you, Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Fowler with Pure Storage. As we just heard from Colin and Jeffrey Ma, there are some incredibly interesting trends in leveraging data for insights that impact businesses in every industry globally. Let's talk about why they're so important and why the need to take action is so urgent. I'll start by taking you back five years. In 2016, when World Economic Forum founder Klaus Schwab first coined the fourth industrial revolution, 4IR, he described it as a technological revolution that would fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another. He described 4IR technologies as fusing the physical, digital, and biological, impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries. Behind those big four IR claims is, of course, big data. Artificial intelligence and quantum computing couldn't run without it. Fast forward to where we are now. What many may have categorized as trends of tomorrow a matter of months ago have become almost overnight must have tools for navigating the current environment. Digital transformation, went from being an initiative over the last 10 years to becoming the initiative. Retail fueled by e-tailing, pharma fueled by speed of research, healthcare fueled by speed of decision-making, and financial services fueled by fintech, productivity fueled by SaaS and cloud. Every industry has been transformed forever. According to Gartner, CEOs are placing their growth bets on increasing investment in digital initiatives. After growth, technology-related change was the second highest priority for CEOs in the 2021 Gartner CEO survey. The bottom line, the risk of losing ground in the emerging 4IR could be even greater now for some businesses in the current environment. McKinsey describes business resilience as the ability of a business to withstand, adapt, and thrive in the face of shocks that are internal and external, as well as known and unanticipated. 
to achieve resilience, every industry must answer immediate pressures to modernize with a new sense of urgency to digitally transform. For example, businesses need to automate and embrace, finally or more fully, four, tech, four IR technologies like cloud computing, AI, the IoT, and high-speed connectivity to support remote work as needed. Many organizations were struggling to keep pace with technological change even before COVID-19, which of course tested resilience like never before. Now, as businesses seek to improve their resilience, companies will want to avoid self-made obstacles, technical, cultural, or organizational, that could impede their progress in adoption of analytics and AI. Future-proofing critical IT infrastructure elements enhances overall business resilience. Without the right foundational IT infrastructure, structured and unstructured data stays locked away, out of reach in legacy silos, warehouses, and data lakes, and facing limits of concurrency, scale, and performance. The superhero is modern analytics, the key to unlocking critical insights that make data actionable and thus more valuable. The need for speed and resilience means being able to act on the data. Not that long ago, we wanted to get from historical data insights to real time, but now real time is practically old hat. Data insights can help businesses increase operational efficiency, reduce costs and risks, create new customer experiences, bring new products and services to market, and much more. Now, data insights must not only be real time, but also predictive and proactive to help businesses adapt to shifting conditions. To deliver that value, modern analytics applications need to efficiently process vast amounts of structured and unstructured data, including machine data like log analytics and data from an array of business applications. Some even process data to get better at processing data with AI and machine learning models that self-improve and deliver insights in real time. Besides an insatiable appetite for data, what all modern data analytics applications also have in common is the need for high-performing and unified storage. Unified fast file and object storage understands that modern data requires multi-protocol and multi-dimensional access with an architecture that can deliver performance regardless of the kind of data. Companies missing that critical element in their IT infrastructure are likely already falling behind in the 4IR. Implementing high-performing cloud-native storage is a key step in shaping the 4IR future. PwC notes that companies successfully deploying 4IR technologies now may emerge as stronger competitors during COVID-era recovery, and they'll likely be better prepared for a potential economic downturn in the future. And according to a PwC study or survey of CFOs, just 22% of their companies are curbing investments in digital transformation, even as the COVID crisis led most to cut back or defer other plan investments. Storage infrastructure that can support modern applications is a necessary foundation for 4IR because it's built for the demands of automation and new sources of data like intelligent sensors. Without modern storage, it's complex and time consuming to attempt adapting to modern cloud architectures and scale for multiple workloads and variable data patterns. This can ultimately diminish ROI on your most valuable asset, your data, and cripple investments in cloud capabilities that are so critical to 4IR technologies. You also risk constraining your ability to perform complex analytics or use data from IoT edge devices. From financial services to telecommunications, healthcare to retail, enterprise workload requirements demand flexibility and the end of data silos. The need to be able to take proactive action in the case of cybersecurity, for example, has never been more acute. Together, Pure and Vertica deliver the power of a cloud data warehouse in hybrid and on-prem data centers by separating compute from storage. Vertica and Eon mode for Pure Storage 
delivers proven massive data capacity, unmatched performance, and the operational ease of use you need to compete. We have been really excited to build and further develop this partnership with Vertica, and we look forward to enabling our joint customers to make an even bigger impact on their businesses in the future. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Our final speaker for today's keynote is Phil Charles, Technical Manager at Jaguar Racing. Vertica is so proud of the work that we're doing with Jaguar as part of the MicroFocus Technical Partnership. The impact that we're already having makes me so proud. And I think when you hear what Phil has to say, it will change your definition and bring it to a whole new level of the phrase data driven. Thank you, Phil, for joining us. And I look forward to hearing what you have to share. My name is Phil Charles. I'm the technical manager for the Jaguar Formula E racing team. I moved from Formula One to Formula E around four years ago. What attracted me to Formula E was the fact that the championship has two main strings to its bow. First and foremost is that the development of the cars is wholly focused around leading edge technology. And secondly, the racing is super close and very exciting. On the tech involved, a race series is possibly one of the best and fastest ways to push technology forwards. You put a load of great people in a scenario where they are competing against each other and the fruits of their labor are measured every other week. In fact, each week the winners are given hero status, they drink champagne, the losers feel the pain of watching them celebrate. There is no better motivation to make that technology work as well as you can. In our case, we are completely focused on developing the electric powertrain. The electric motor generator unit, the inverter that goes with it, the gearbox and the driveline all the way down to the upright. And for completeness, that also includes the suspension around the powertrain. In Formula E, all of that hardware is homologated for a race season. So just prior to the start of the championship, those components are locked in. However, Formula E, and in fact the development of any electric powertrain, is not just about specifying and manufacturing some really cool hardware. The systems and software used to control those items, along with the algorithms to optimise the usage of energy, are key to its performance. To that end, the optimization of control systems, which generate a lot of data, are the key to success in Formula E. In Formula One, history tells us that being the best at aerodynamics means that you win lots of races. And in fact, in recent years, the best powertrain and aero combination has been most triumphant. In Formula E, our game is about making the best electric powertrain. Then, after that, we exist in a software arms race. The teams are in a race to control their high bandwidth powertrains better than the others, to be more efficient than the others. And every other week, we play a very intense game of high-speed chess for 45 minutes. In that chess game, we send our drivers armed with our on-car and pit wall strategy tools into a racing battle with a fixed amount of energy, the victor getting to a finish line sooner than the others. Using that energy strategically is extremely important, as at the same time a load of other cars are trying to use the same narrow line of tarmac as optimally as they can. Now, let's turn to how Vertica fits into the analytics and machine learning software capability arms race that, that we are in. Vertica and its real-time analytics and machine learning capabilities are a great fit for our environment, as they can improve data-driven performance on and off the track. Our teams have been working together behind the scenes for a few months now, and I'm extremely pleased with the performance that Vertica is already unlocking. The number of engineers that we are allowed to have work on the data, both at the track side and back in mission control at our headquarters in the UK, is limited by the championship regulations. As such, we need to maximize our resources productivity in short and critical time windows. To do so, we need to exploit the best techniques available in terms of data processing and analytics. To gain insight quickly is key for our engineers. The in-database analytical functions in Vertica have already shown to accelerate that process. And as always, the proof is in the pudding. So far in season seven, we have completed seven races, and I'm proud to say that a Jaguar car has finished on the podium five times. As we now go through in a bit more detail, I'm sure you will see parallels with your organization. We are on different tracks, but we're all in a similar type of race. We're all making decisions based on some form of analytics and machine learning. Firstly, let's put the data generated in the race weekend into perspective. It was recently reported that NASCAR would generate 100 million data points over a single race weekend. 
putting Formula E and Jaguar racing into perspective, with Vertica, we loaded more than 3 billion data points for just Season 7's race weekend in Rome. Data is growing in importance and volume in Formula E. Optimally tuning aspects of the car, the powertrain, suspension, steering, braking and power management can only be done if we have timely, accurate and complete data visibility. Powerful analytics and machine learning to analyse, predict and act. A clear example is the raw data logged on the car. Once that data is downloaded, Vertica can give us immediate access to more than half a billion data points on which we can run analytics and machine learning capabilities that enable us to glean impactful results. Formula E is a perfect fit to exploit Vertica's capabilities. When you look back at a race event, a Formula E race day is also a blur of decisions and actions. It is unique in the fact that everything happens in a single day, or to be more precise, 11 hours. We start at 6am and by 5pm it's all done. In that short amount of time, we do two practice sessions, a full qualifying session and a race. In that 11 hours, we are generating roughly 100 gigabyte of data that needs to be analysed as quickly as possible to improve the car performance for the next session. We therefore rely heavily on software to process that data for us. Vertica opens a new door for us. We collect as much data as we can in a well-defined and centralised analytical database and make it available to the relevant people at the track and at the factory quickly. We use Vertica's scalable and extensible MPP architecture to query the data and gain as much insight as we can. For example, there are more than 7,000 parameters in the car and by running supervised or non-supervised reliability checks, Vertica can help the engineers make a decision to swap a faulty component just in time before the next session. So, Vertica helps keep the car running as well as making it faster. The same logic applies to many other parts of the team, such as the strategy group and the use of our driver in the loop simulator. In the latter, we do sessions with the race drivers prior to the real event, where we generate more than 250 gigabytes of data. Again, Formula E is quite unique in this respect. We get the final track layout just two weeks before the event. That leaves us with just one week to work on the prep of the racetrack with the drivers before we all travel to the race event in the second week. Optimization of our time is again key. We are developing new approaches to analyze that data with Vertica. We've been amazed by its performance and we're pushing as hard as we can to speed up its integration into every part of the team. Our legacy systems were just not fit for our goals, taking ages to load and query data, restricting us to a set volume of data we could handle and forcing us to work with aggregate and downsampled data. With Vertigo, we now have full access to all the raw data for every signal, for every test day, qualifying and race session, all at our fingertips. So far, we are just scratching the surface with Vertica, but we are amazed at the broad analytical and machine learning capabilities. We are doing things with Vertica that were just not possible with our previous database systems. By getting data into Vertica blazingly fast and with sub-second query response times, our race engineers in the factory have been able to realize value in the data between practice, qualifying and race sessions. That was just not possible to do before. And query performance has been phenomenal with Vertica. Using live aggregate projections, we accelerated a single query from 60 seconds to 15 milliseconds. This opens many avenues in terms of data analytics. By running the queries inside Vertica, we are now exploiting its capabilities such as machine learning and optimization techniques. This helps us find patterns and trends. For example, what driver's actions or car setup make our tires work in their happiest window? What's on the road ahead? Running in database analytics and machine learning will be a real game changer for Jaguar Racing. With access to all the data, 700 plus in database functions and those super fast query results, Vertica helps us to make those time critical decisions that impact how we manage and operate the cars. With Vertica's extensible framework, we are also looking forward to expanding beyond those 700 plus in database functions. Using Vertica's user-defined extensions written in Python, Java, C++ or R, we have already built a bespoke low-pass filter to run against our data. That ensures top analytical performance without having to move the data to other systems or tools. Vertica Analytics and machine learning ultimately delivers an edge that leads to more points, podiums and wins for Jaguar Racing. In summary, in today's fast-paced, data-driven world, there may only be a few seconds or less between first and second place. But the difference between first and second place for business success is huge. Thanks for having me. 
I'm very excited to participate in Vertica Unify 2021. Thank you, Phil. I'll be cheering for Jaguar Formula E racing all season, and I'll be proud to know that Vertica is contributing to all the wins I'm confident you'll have. Now the code for today's keynote session is Golden Retriever. Be sure to enter that code into the Analyze to Win platform so you can earn a point, earn prizes, and most importantly to me, make a difference in a dog's life. Now you have 30 minutes to visit our sponsor showcases, Platinum and Gold, where you'll see live demos of their technology and also earn points. And 30 minutes from now, our breakout sessions will begin. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for day two of Vertica Unify Keynote. Thanks everyone.